Castle Chansonnet, Volume 1, written by Charlotte e. English and narrated by Diana Croft. The Queen's Filter Have you ever been to Castle Chansonnet? Perhaps you go there as a peddler, selling ribbons and cosmetics and jewels to the inhabitants of the royal court. Perhaps you are a cook or an ostler or an apothecary, tending to the residents' many and varied needs in exchange for a few silvers of your own. You may be a wizard or a wizard's apprentice, off to be found in the libraries in the small hours of the morning, weary-eyed in pursuit of an elusive cantrip. Or perhaps, just perhaps, you are a noble yourself, attending the court in your satins and silks and making your bows to their majesties. Have you, then, met the Queen? Queen Malani, they say, is a lady of surpassing handsomeness, if not precisely beauty. Doubtless her velvets and her jewels would grant handsomeness enough were she insufficient in feature. An air of majesty and power would supply the rest, would it not, and a queen must have a surfeit of both. She is a little younger than his majesty, the king, but not much, with honey-coloured hair not at all given to grey, so they say. Her eyes are the colour of amethysts, proclaim the fanciful or the fawning. Others speak of her voice, low and mellow, melodious as a lady's voice should be. Perhaps these observers have seen her from afar, in their majesty's feasting chamber or at a royal ball. They cannot have seen her in person, not up close, not in the intimate fashion of a friend or an associate, for if they had, they would sing a different tune. If you have ever chanced to glimpse Queen Melania in private, as she sits, almost unattended, in her glass house, say, or before she retires to her bed, you might not speak of handsomeness of velvets or of jewel-coloured eyes. You might be more disposed to say, Her Majesty is tired. Fetch me the wizard Garstang, said this lady one eventide. She spoke in the dusty, whispering tones of an exhausted soul, so faint the syllables that one must strain to catch them at all. But her lady-in-waiting, Aramanta, had sharp ears. Yes, ma'am, answered she, and left the glass house at once in a flurry of emerald silks, the queen was left alone, which seemed to suit her, for she sat motionless, her eyes half closed. There is at least one advantage to weariness. There is a peace in it, for if one has not the vitality to go rushing about the world, one must by necessity place oneself somewhere comfortable and stay. A deep serenity enveloped the glass house once Aramanta was gone for everything else in it was passing into slumber. The sun's blinding rays were gone, dipped below the horizon, leaving a tranquil blue haze in its wake. The queen's flowers had furled their petals and stood dreaming in the dusk. Even the winged things that occupied the upper reaches of the rambling vines were silent in their nests. A lunar moth drifted slowly by, its silvered wings glinting in the light of the queen's moon-coloured lamps. Aramanta did not return, and nor did the wizard Garstang appear. There came, though, another voice. A dry, smoky cough stirred the air near the queen's knees, and then somebody spoke. Majesty? Queen Malani's eyes opened, they appeared a faded blue, barely any colour left to them at all, but perhaps it was a mere trick of the light. A dragon crouched by her feet, its ruby shimmering head dipped in a show of respect, or possibly uncertainty. Yes, said the Queen, still in those dusty tones, for there was no need to exert herself here. 
what manner of service is it you want? said the dragon, curling a long, fire-tipped tail around clawed feet. Something in the voice told Her Majesty that this creature was of a female persuasion, and she was looking expectant. The Queen achieved a frown. I am not acquainted with any red dragons, she said slowly, and I do not recall that I asked for one. I wasn't either, said the dragon in answer to this first observation, until recently when I turned into one. But I am not always red, as it happens. I was blue yesterday, and perhaps I shall be golden tomorrow. The frown deepened. And you did not summon me, continued the dragon helpfully. You called for my master Garstang, but being as he's the wizard, well, he's nowhere to be found. They're rarely anywhere you want them, wizards, and if they are, it's like to be a week late. Queen Malani said nothing, but the befuddlement creeping into her pallid face said enough. I'm Jessamine, said the dragon, the wizard's apprentice, once, though I cannot say as I was any good at it. I'm the wizard's familiar now, though, and I am good at that. Were you wanting anything a wizard's familiar might be able to do? This last question was uttered with a note of anxiety, as though the creature, uncertain of her own relevance, sought reassurance on the subject. Her Majesty, however, had not the first idea. I need a new filter, she said. The wizard Garstang enchants them for me, and he must do so again, at once. It took the poor lady some time to utter so many words together, but Jessamine did not lack for patience. She waited, politely enough, until the queen's strivings had ceased. It'll not be the classic sort of filter you're wanting, will it? Jessamine mused. You've the love of his majesty the king already, not to mention a castle full of courtiers and a kingdom full of subjects. That's enough love for anybody, I should think. Indeed, said the queen. Jessamine subjected her liege lady to a long look and a deep scrutiny. Something along the restorative lines, then, she offered. Indeed, said the queen. Hmm. Jessamine, perceiving that Queen Malani lacked either knowledge of the subject or the capacity to express it, asked no further questions. If the wizard's anywhere to be found, he'll be along soon, I make no doubt, she said. But that's as may be. The matter's urgent, I judge. She performed a fleeting bow, a dip of her rubescent head all wreathed in smoke and grinned. All her long, pearly teeth showed. I will see what I can do, she promised, and scuttled off. The queen, bemused, said nothing, but slipped back into her half-slumber. Queen Malani was a merry figure, Jessamine would previously have said, merry and formidable in equal measure, a fair bit of each, a distant being of bright gold hair, a flashing smile, and an air of majesty only a born queen possesses. But not today, alone in her glass house, without her pomp and ceremony, without her court. For a moment, Jessamine had felt the larger of the two, and she being but a small heart and a shrinking soul herself. Which was the true queen? The wizard would know, but the wizard was not to be found. Jessamine scurried through the winding labyrinth of the castle, barely aware of the passages she slithered down and the chambers she passed by. Her mind, small it may be, but it was keen for all that, occupied her with reflections of a new kind. Who among her acquaintance was all that they seemed to be? The wizard, for instance, what might lie behind the vibrant, glittering colours of the man? Was he, too, a poor, quailing thing beneath the arrogance and the laughter, like Jessamine? 
or wearied to his very soul, like the queen and only pretending otherwise. The thought prompted a snicker, inconceivable. The door to the potionry stood shut fast, with the impregnable demeanour of a locked and bolted barrier. A muffled clattering emanated from within, and a curse or two in Tambul's hoarse voice. Jessamine made of herself a puff of smoke and wafted under the door. What's amiss? said she, retaking her draconic curves upon the other side. Tambul, the wizard's new apprentice, turned an aggravated face upon her. His hair, never very well behaved at the best of times, appeared to be staging a full-scale revolt, for every white wisp of it stood on end. His compact form bristled with indignation. The little man fair radiated rage. You look like to fly into pieces in another minute, said Jessamine. Can you not mellow yourself a trifle? It's those sylphs, he spat staring wildly at the empty air around himself. They've taken the wizard's wishful elixir, and I have but just finished mixing it. He'll not be pleased, and then who'll be to blame? He swiped uselessly at the air, coming up with nothing. Jessamine, seeing nothing resembling a floating file, judged the thing long concealed. Come now, is this the truth? she called. It is too bad of you. A chorus of laughter answered her, and then the file reappeared. One of the larger ones, Jessamine saw, airy glass and filled to the brim with a party-coloured liquid. Tambor had made a lot. But he is no fun, breathed a voice in her air, even as the file floated its way sulkily into Tambor's reaching hands. Aye, but you make him still less so with such treatment. Jessamine reproved. She could not disagree. She hadn't taken to the new apprentice herself, he being of a sour disposition and not seeming sensible of his immense good fortune in assisting the wizard Garstang. But he had talents far exceeding her own. This she could not deny, and the wizard seemed contented with him. She received only a gusty sigh in response. Tamble snatched up his phial and stuffed it immediately into the velvet potion bag hanging from his belt. This will not come out again until it goes into the wizard's own hands, he informed the heir, scowling. Tamble, said Jessamine. The look he gave her might be irritable, but no more, the return of his elixir having mollified him a shade. Yes, we've an emergency. That word, to Jessamine's surprise, operated powerfully upon the wizard's apprentice. He snapped to attention, forgot his grievances in an instant, and seemed somehow taller for it. What's the matter? It's Her Majesty the Queen, though not as I ever saw her before. She looks like to fade away any minute, Tambul, so tired as she is. I'd swear she was a century old, somewhere under the golden hair. She wants a filter from the wizard, but can't say as what's in it, and no one can find him. Tamble attended closely to this jumbled recital, and did not plague her with questions. The Queen's filter, he mused, seems to me as I've heard mention of it before, but I've no notion how it's made, and we have nothing of that sort in the potionry just now. Jessamine's heart sank. Then do you know where the wizard has gone? His brows quirked. If the familiar hasn't a notion, how then should I? Jessamine flattened, gave a wispy sigh. When had anybody kept pace with the wizard Garstang after all? Not even he could keep up with himself, she'd wager. Things fell out of his brain as rapidly as they wandered into it. Then what are we to do? said she. Where did you hear of the filter, Tamble? Did the wizard mention it to you? No, said he, wiping his hands on the colour-stained apron he wore before tearing it off. I have not been set to make any such thing. It was in a book, methinks. One of the grimoires, interrupted Jessamine, her heart rising. 
I, but I'm forbidden to go into them except in the wizard's own presence. You ought to recall that. I do, Jessamine agreed. So you would be, but I am not. I'm the familiar these days, and he hasn't said as I'm to leave them alone now. He hasn't said as much, repeated Tamble. But does that mean he hasn't intended it? It hardly matters, Jessamine decided. We've need of those grimoires, and if the wizard's unhappy with me, he may tell me all about it later. For now, we're to the secret library, and quickly. The wizard's study seemed a lively place when the wizard was in it, not so much when it stood empty. It echoed in rather chilly fashion, odd given the profusion of carpets and cushions and curtains, and it only did it when Garstang was off some place, as though his absence had disemboweled it of something. The best of all chairs stood in its customary spot in the best corner, towering over the more mundane articles of furniture, and sporting all the best of the soft things. It didn't speak as Jessamine and Tamble came in. Neither did anything else, in fact, until Jessamine lightly kicked the mossy carpet that lay before the empty hearth. Whisht! uttered the carpet, a sound not unlike a sneeze. It quivered. Well, what is it? Is the wizard handy? said Jessamine to start. I've no notion at all. Not then. Well, and is the library about? She tried next. The carpet fluttered a helpless little gesture. You'd have to ask the shelves. The library should not, strictly speaking, be its own entity at all, being as it was a collection of shelves itself, and books, of course, always those. But things about the wizard had a way of turning odd, and in this case, the library had a will of its own. Jessamine turned to the shelves, at least those she could see. Not part of the library, these, or not officially. They were the ones that hung about in the open, where just anybody could see them, and housed only the lesser books. But if you wanted to find a library, a bookshelf was always a good place to begin. Jessamine redirected her question to these humble creatures, wrought all of polished, dark wood as they were, and burdened with jewelled things. They occupied the wall several feet above her head, a lofty position from which they loomed over everything but the best of all chairs. A silence followed, rather a long one. At length, a dusty voice said, and what would you with the library? I need a grimoire, said Jessamine, promptly and firmly. If you sounded like you were uncertain of your right to things, people tended to get obstructive ideas. The Queen's in trouble, and the wizard has the answer, and I've to find it, quickly. Right or, said the shelf, and the wall behind it shivered. It had no right to perform so delicate a manoeuvre, being probably a foot thick and made of solid stone. It did, however, and it creaked as well and groaned and then stopped and fell silent. Nothing had moved, not even the wall, and Jessamine experienced a profound confusion until it occurred to her that all was changed. The shelf she'd spoken with was gone, perhaps, or only altered, hard to say, when everything was made from the same deep brown wood and held a similar array of leather-bound spell books. But these were different books, and that was a different shelf. How oh, splendid, she cried, and swarmed up the wizard's favourite chair. The back of it rose quite six feet high, a suitable vantage point from which a dragon and but a small dragon at that, might peruse the spoils. Tamble stood upon the chair's seat. He would be made into gloves, Jessamine reflected, if the wizard came back and saw him at it, but that was his own lookout. Besides, they had a queen to save, and heroes were obliged to perform a daring manoeuvre once in a while. 
Jessamine seized upon the best spellbook, the chief grimoire, the wizard's prized collection of cantrips. Being as it was such, the book was of mighty size and sumptuous demeanour, its covers sapphire blue and gilded and its manner self-satisfied. It harumphed a little as Jessamine leafed through its pages, but it didn't object. The trouble is, I hardly know what I'm looking for, she commented to Tamble. Aye, said he grimly. It's not like to be helpfully labelled the Queen's personal tonic in case my familiar and my apprentice should be obliged to mix it in my unexplained absence now, is it? You'll get used to it, offered Jessamine. By it, I suppose you mean him, and I may at that, grumbled Tamble, but not before I lose my wits altogether. Jessamine permitted herself a small, smoky snicker. Really, it was invigorating to have someone to grumble with, someone who understood, as she did, how maddening the lofty wizard Garstang could be. Indeed, he delighted in it, the wretch. If he had not been threatened with defenestration by a maddened subordinate, he considered the day wasted. Oh, but, she said, arrested in the midst of these pleasant reflections. But, Tamble, it is. It is what? Tamble set aside the emerald-bound tome he had been perusing, and Jessamine passed the grimoire down to him. His face turned thunderous. The Queen's excellent filter, he read aloud, for the information of my inferiors, should I be unable to oblige Her Majesty. The tip of Jessamine's tail began an irritated, staccato twitching. Tamble's face only darkened further as he read on. This is some manner of joke, he announced. One measure of cochineal ground up fine, dissolved in aqua pura and let a simple cantrip be uttered over it that it might manifest a starry radiance. That doesn't sound too hard, said Jessamine hopefully. Tamble shut the book in disgust. You really were the worst apprentice, weren't you? Yes, said Jessamine placidly, having never felt the slightest interest in the mechanics of potion-making. So you had better explain the source of your indignation, hadn't you? What's cochineal? Cochineal, ground up fine, is the parts of an insect, he answered, powdered. Some fine magical insect, said Jessamine, smiling, with healthful properties for Her Majesty the Queen. A red insect, said Tamble, a fine strong colour. No, an insect that is red only with no mystical qualities, Jessamine, not even of any kind. It is a charming colour, I'm told, often used to stain the lips of court ladies, and that is all. The... the cantrip, then? Jessamine faltered. That twinkly effect? Looks pretty, I grant you, and impressive, if you're disposed to enjoy such things. Damble's sour tone left his own feelings on the subject of sparkles very clear indeed, but of no use to the Queen's health or anyone's. Jessamine turned this information over. So we're to mix up a red liquid that looks impressive, she concluded. Yes. And which does nothing at all. Yes. Jessamine enjoyed a brief, fervent desire to set fire to the wizard Garstang's study, but with a strong effort of will she refrained. It isn't a joke, she offered. It must be. It can't be. How could he have known to arrange it? For all his odd talents, clairvoyance was never among them. The whole library is probably a jest, muttered Tamble. Put here merely to torment us. The real secret library is somewhere else. But Jessamine knew better. She had one advantage over Tamble, ignorant as she may be about the potions, and that was seniority. The library was the real one, 
and so was the first favourite spell book. So the filter must be the one he gave to the Queen. Was there nothing else written there? she asked, with the measures for the filter. Tamble scowled, wrenched open the grimoire again, and leafed through it. More nonsense, he said. Let it be administered in Her Majesty's glass house at the golden hour of the day. He shook his head in disgust. What possible difference the place should make when a filter's taken, I can't imagine. And what's the golden hour? The golden hour changes through the year, said Jessamine. Haven't you ever noticed it? It's late after the noon, when the sun sinks low, and all the world is bathed in gold light. Tamble's brows rose. No, he said, I haven't noticed. Tamble clearly possessing as much soul as a block of wood, Jessamine abandoned all further attempts to enliven his mind. The sun's coming up, she said, uncurling herself from the top of the wizard's chair and creeping down. We'd better hurry along, if we're to have the stuff by the afternoon. You cannot mean we're to pursue this absurd plan, Tamble spluttered. We're to feed Her Majesty the Queen coloured water with stars in it and call it a filter. Yes, but tis trickery. If it's trickery, it's the wizard's trickery, said Jessamine firmly. And once in a while, you know, he has sound reason for the doing of it. To the mixery, Tamble, we have work to do. The filter, such as it was, took no time to prepare, Tamble being handy enough at the art. But before that could be managed, there was the cochineal to unearth. The wizard not being the organised type, he had left his jar of it, open and half empty, in the south-facing breakfast parlour. Then a suitable cantrip had to be chosen for the making of the stars, Wizard Garstang had not seen fit to record his own, preferred charm in the book, and Tamble said, somewhat aggrieved, I have not been much in the habit of making things twinkle. Jessamine assisted as she could, scurrying hither and thither, and anxiously watched the sun's progress across the sky. More than one carpet or a set of drapes began to smoke as she passed, and had to be hastily beaten. At last, though, the mixing was complete, and Tamble declared himself satisfied. He handed a clear bottle filled with carmine liquid to Jessamine, who curled the tip of her tail around the neck of it and carried it high. She'd reached the mixery's stout oak door before she realised he was not following. Come along, said she, giving off sparks. My task is to mix, he said rather loftily, gazing down at her from beneath dark brows. "'Tis the wizard's to administer, or in this case, yours.' "'You think it won't work?' said Jessamine. "'And you'd rather it were my fault when it fails and not yours.' "'Of course it will not work. It is coloured water. "'Will you have a little faith in the wizard, if not in me?' Tamble's scowl deepened. Something's bound to happen when the Queen drinks your coloured water. Do you want to see what it is or not? Tamble heaved a great sigh and took off his colour-stained apron again. Very well. And if it doesn't turn out well, we can always blame the wizard, added Jessamine cheerily. After all, it's his spell book. That being so, Tamble agreed and swept up the grimoire in question, as proof, no doubt, for when he needed to explain himself to the Queen. The afternoon was speeding by, and the sun was sinking. Jessamine wasted no more time on words and sped along herself, trusting to the wizard's apprentice to keep up as he could. The route from the mixery to the Queen's glass house was a winding one, and couldn't be done quickly. At length, however... Jessamine burst through the gilded doors and found herself once again embedded in green verdure. The enchanted windows shimmered in the golden light of the dying day, and the place seemed, indeed, different. Warm and mellow and sweet, like bathing in honey. 
Queen Milani sat where Jessamine had left her, in her handsome chair, framed by long-leafed ferns and dreaming lilies. A songbird, feathered in purple and blue, sat on her shoulder, singing. The queen sat still and slumped, her eyes half-closed. But when Jessamine approached, those eyes opened and fixed upon her. Did they seem a trifle less faded blue than before, or did the dragon's hopes mislead her? Majesty, panted Jessamine, prostrating herself before royalty, or every part of herself save her tail, which she carried higher than ever. We've the wizard's filter for you. But not the wizard himself, I note. No, Majesty, Jessamine admitted. I haven't seen him. Nor I, added Tamble, bowing again. The Queen frowned. He'll turn up, Jessamine assured her. He always comes back, you know, like bad weather or a headache. The filter, answered the Queen. Jessamine swarmed up the arm of the royal throne and permitted Her Majesty to take the bottle from her. She had to concentrate to keep her sparks and her smokes to herself and not waft them about. She was a trifle unsettled. The Queen wasted no time but removed the bottle stopper at once and quaffed the starry contents. A smile crossed her weary face immediately. Not so very dazzling a smile, only a little one, but it was a start. Then she gave a slow sigh and settled deeper into her chair. Jessamine felt a pang of disappointment having hoped the lady might, with new energy, surge out of her chair and dance a jig about the glass house. Tamble's knowing look seemed gloating. But the Queen's posture was losing its slump, rather. The smile had not gone away, and her eyes were brighter. She opened them wider and looked at Jessamine with more interest and attention than she had exhibited before. She scrutinised Tamble, too. The wizard's minions, is it? She mused. Almost as good as a whole wizard between you. Better, said Jessamine stoutly, for we've not mislaid ourselves. Nor left a whole jar of cochineal out in the open, where anything might have got into it, said Tamble less relevantly. The queen gave a tiny, decorous belch, and out came a star and floated off. He usually stays to talk, she observed, once I've drunk the filter. We could do that, offered Jessamine. Tamble looked ready to object. She frowned him down. What would your majesty wish to talk about? Queen Milani considered this, shifting in her chair. It was the first real movement she'd exhibited since the previous eventide. Tell me of your day, she commanded, and the making of this filter. And the wizard, is he good to you? Is he a stern master? I feel that he would be quite stern, but you've such a charming degree of disloyalty towards him, I feel I must be wrong. Quite wrong, your Majesty, agreed Jessamine, and launched into an account of all that had come to pass, aided here and there by Tamble, whose reflections tended towards the sour, but the Queen only laughed. And as the afternoon wore away, and the golden hour slowly faded, Jessamine knew that what the Queen needed was less the filter and more the friend who brought it. You'll come again, will you? said Her Majesty at last, rising from her chair as the light faded from the skies. But of course, said Jessamine, smiling and showing all her teeth, you'll need another filter, won't you? Shall we say tomorrow? The day after, decided the Queen, stretching and drifting towards the door. I shall be quite well until then.